Hallelujah. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor, for inviting me all over, all the way from Nigeria by way of London. Thank you so much, Pastor Tom, for inviting me. I said it, it has to take God for you to invite somebody that you are in the same dormitory together. Yes, it has to take God. But I'd like you to really appreciate your pastor or your pastor's wife today because if you realize that she studied in University of Ife, where I went to and studied electronic and electrical engineering, she was, she's a woman in STEM like me. You need to respect her on several levels. So I want you to really appreciate her. Now, very serious. You know, sometimes the people we have with us all the time, we begin to take them for granted. We forget to honor them. We forget to show them the love. The processes you have in this age, right? The processes you have, the way things work. I'm not saying it's not all glory to God, and I'm not, not giving credit to pastor, but I know even pastor knows that if he had married a different person, this isn't what we'll be talking about. Don't you, pastor? Or your girls are like that. <laughs> You may be seated. It's not easy being a woman in a man's world. Hallelujah. I thank the Holy Spirit for his presence here. Without whom we'll do nothing and can do nothing. How many people were here yesterday? Good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I remember you, mommy. Without him, we can't do anything. So we appreciate his presence here. And we know he's the one who's going to do everything in this short 28 minutes that we have Psalm 110 Psalm 110 I want to talk about purpose that deals with fear see the Bible says in the beginning God said I am the one who sets the beginning from the end and from ancient times the things not yet done saying I will fulfill my pleasure I will do all my good pleasure what he's saying is that before God starts something he has finished it already therefore when you know that you need not be afraid of the end because you know that before he plants a baby in your womb, the baby is born. In fact, you think he planted a baby in your womb. He planted maybe a president. He planted maybe a governor. He planted a leader in your womb and you thought you just got pregnant. But God already saw the end. In fact, it's because he knew that Israel needed a judge that he planted Samuel in the womb of Anna. And the timing was perfect. Are you getting it now? And you're thinking, well, I'm just here by accident. But he says, I had gone before you. I'd finished everything. Therefore, you are worrying, where will I be able to send my son to college? Where will I be? And he says, but I already see the end. And the end is good. Amen. Knowing purpose crushes fear in your life. So we see in Psalm 110, God articulating his purpose to somebody. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. I want you to understand something. In this Psalm 110, I want to take you into the cure for fear, the cure for depression, and the cure for boredom. Because, yeah, boredom. Because you see, a lot of us come to church, and when you ask them, what is your purpose? Someone answered me once, a few years ago. She said to me, at that time, that, oh, I just want to make heaven. And I couldn't figure it out. How does somebody get born again to want to make heaven? If you wanted to make heaven, I'm going to step on your toes, and you still love me. And I'm going to destroy your paradigms, and you still love me. Because you need to see things differently if you're going to have a different result. Isn't it? You were there yesterday. You've changed it. It's good. So, <laughs> so you see, if you were supposed to go to heaven and that was your main drive, the minute you got born again, I have a feeling Jesus would have vaporized you and taken you to heaven. So why are you here? In this scripture, God is showing us why you are here. It says, after Jesus rose from the dead and took his blood to the, to the heavenly place, to the altar, and God accepted him, he says, the Lord, Yahweh, said unto my Lord, my Adonai, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. It means God Almighty, the self-existent one, was articulating the purpose for your life and the purpose, the new dispensation. Are you getting it already? Good. So Yahweh said unto my Lord, we're going to dissect it very quickly. Yahweh, the self-existent one, the one who exists, either you worship him or not, either you come to church or not, either you agree with what he's doing in your life or not. That's the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. The father said to the son, my Lord, my Lord, Adon is the meaning of Lord here. It means my sovereign. A lot of us call him Lord, but he is not Lord in our lives, really. He may be savior, but it's very different being a savior and being a Lord. 
When somebody is a lord, what he says you do. Uh -huh. When somebody is a lord, when you don't even like what he's doing, you stay. Jesus said, when Jesus said you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the Hebrews find cannibalism very abhorrent. So they couldn't understand what he was saying. Some people left him. And then he said to Peter, will you leave me also? And Peter said in John 6, 68, where shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. So we do not serve God because of what he gives us or because he gives us breakthroughs. We serve him because we love. So Jehovah said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Note, sit. That means he was standing. He was standing. The lion of the tribe of Judah was standing while his father was sitting. And until the father gave the invitation, sit at my right hand. <laughs> sit means settle down completely at my right hand. Dwell in ease at my right hand. That means he is no longer working. And it means the work has passed to another set of people. You don't get it yet. He is no longer working. Jesus has done what he will do. Hebrews 7 25 makes it clear that all that is left is that he's making intercession for us. Do you get? So to whom has the work passed if he's no longer working? He says, sit down at my right hand into the place of honor until I make your enemies the, your footstool. The word said there means God spoke as an oracle. And I, I'm, I'll explain to you why I'm teaching this morning. If he did not speak as an oracle, Jesus could not sit. What I mean is that if there is no prophetic word, if there is no word that sits you upon your throne, you are just sitting on a chair. The difference between a throne and a chair is the person who sits on it and the word that placed you on it. If God did not send you there, you sent yourself there, you must keep yourself there. Should I say it again? If God did not send you and you sent yourself, you must maintain yourself. That's a stress. If man sent you and God did not send you, man must maintain you there. But if you allow God to sit you, sit you in that marriage, sit you in that job, sit you in that country, sit you in that business, God himself will maintain you regardless of how hard things become. Allow him to sit you. That's the difference between appointment and hustle. Kingdom people do not take jobs, they take assignments. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sit down at my right hand. We're still on verse 1. Until I make thine enemies your footstool. God says, I will be the one to make your enemies your footstool. Say to your neighbor, God is involved. If God sits you, God is involved. That's what it means. Says the battle passes from you to me. If I am the one who brought you to that place. But if you brought yourself to that place, note the battle is all yours. You're on your own. Until I make your enemies your footstool. He didn't say until I make the Christians enemies your footstool. Until I make Tone's enemies or Jumoke's enemies your footstool. Your own enemies are the ones I'm interested in. See pastor, sometimes God's enemies are not our enemies. We have our own, maybe your mother-in-law is your enemy. But as far as God is concerned, he has some identified enemies. Things are going on in the land. God is interested in nations and institutions and we are still interested in individuals. He's seen institutions being torn down. And he says, those who are tearing down institutions are my enemies. And you are interested in one individual who hurt you, who stepped on your toes and whatever. You are not that important. I said it yesterday. In the scheme of things, Satan is only interested in you as far as you are interested in God's agenda. So half the time when you say Satan did something, Satan is like, I don't know anything about it. Though. Verse 2. Verse 2 quickly. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. I have time. Rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. Thank you, technical verse 2. <laughs> the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. He is talking about a person here when he talks about the rod of God's strength, not an inanimate object. He's not talking about a staff. The rod of his strength is the Holy Spirit of God whom I acknowledged before I began to speak. He is the executive arm of the Godhead on earth. You see him in creation. The Bible says the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. But somebody was brooding upon the face of that darkness. Without whom there will be no earth. Without whom there will be no life. Without whom there will be nothing in your life. So we see the rod of God's strength coming out of the church. Which means the church shall become the instrumentality of carrying the presence of God to the nations. Somebody gets in it. It's cold in here. All right. It says, rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. <laughs> it's important to know two things. 
We talk about the rod of strength, of power, then we say rule. Are we really ruling? Let's be frank. Are we just existing or are we surviving? I'm going to really challenge your paradigms today. And you still love you. In fact, you invite me back. <laughs> the difference between an immigrant and ambassador is who sent you. An ambassador is sent by the home country. Therefore, the home country takes care of the ambassador. They don't buy fuel. They don't send their kids to school. You don't, they don't care. They, the country takes care of your wife, has to do something with your dressing, gives you a house. You are struggling for a mortgage. The ambassador must always live at the best address in town. So who sent you? Some people send themselves. Well, some people God sent. And what is the difference between an ambassador and an immigrant? The agenda you pursue. Should I say it again? Because I may have to decode it. An ambassador is pursuing the agenda of the home country. An immigrant is hustling for his own survival. That means if I can make that paradigm shift right now here and say, here I am, God send me. I'm in America, but I want to do what you want me to do. I'm in America, but I want to pursue your agenda. I want you to take care of me. Therefore, I will look to the things you look to. I will let your pain become my pain and your burden become my burden. Use me. Use my platform. Use the job I have. I have to become like Esther. For as long as Esther was in the palace pursuing her own agenda, she was just any other person. The minute she took up God's agenda, Esther become, became that woman who is named a book after her and the only woman I know that wrote a decree that affected 127 provinces. She was the only woman I know. That a feast is celebrated because of her, the feast of purity. Because she transisted from being an ordinary woman and an immigrant to somebody who said, God, use me and see what I will do. It's a paradigm shift. Your neighbor, when you get home, does not know you've taken that decision. It's internal. But the things that are not seen are eternal in the heavens. Do you understand? Just a shift inside that God, the job I have, use it. The skills I have, use it. The talent I have, use it. Even my beauty, if you got it, use it. The Lord shall send the strength, the rod of his strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Rule thou. And he says, sit down on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He's saying to Jesus, until. That means there is a time lag for even God who is on the throne. That means God waits for a result. How come in your life you think you will not wait? How come you think the breakthrough is going to be instant coffee? If God on the throne can wait. You see, when you hear those testimonies that there is no waiting involved, there's some secret things that cannot be told mm, in those testimonies. Because if it is God, there will be a waiting period. <laughs> Hallelujah. Rule in the midst of your enemies. We do not rule in the absence of our enemies. We rule right there in their midst because we are created to be salt and we are created to be light. You said, I, I said, this message will cure you of your boredom. You need to think about it very well. God says we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. But we want to make ourselves the salt of the church. You will get it. Morning first service is usually like this because it's for people who need to come and go to business school do other things during the day it's like come quickly just do what you have to do very quickly and get out it's like catholic mass so i'm fine nobody can intimidate me into i'm used to this i've been ministering for 35 years i'm fine i'm cool i love you too we rule in the midst of our enemies because we're salt of the earth. The salt of the church is what all of us want to be. We all want to do something on the pulpit, struggle with the pastor for the mic, because we think that the power of God in our lives is to be displayed in the church and nowhere else. And God is saying that that power that I put in your life, the anointing on your life, is for Goldman Sachs, is for JP Morgan, is for Bank of America, is for Merrill Lynch. That is where you're supposed to take the power of God and begin to display superior solutions so that we Christians stop being a nuisance. We stop being looked at as 
just bigots. We just thought we looked as a narrow-minded people, but as a people who carry a superior solution. Therefore, if they like you or not, they have to deal with the fact that you always have the answers. If they like you or not, they have to deal with the fact that your own children are not on coke, they're not on meth, they're not on anything. They want to know how it is that you manage your own children when their own children talk back at them. They want to know how do you do it that you are not divorced when I can no longer stand my husband that I married a year ago. Ah, the Bible says in the book of Micah chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 and Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be exalted above the mountains and above all hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Why will all nations flow? How come we're going to be exalted? Because we're going to start doing things excellently. Because the things, the, 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 the solutions that they're looking for, we're going to start coming out of the church. I remember when we first gave our lives to Christ. I don't know if it happened to Pastor Tom because I gave my life to Christ at 11 or something. And then by the time I was like 16, they said, you can't listen to some certain types of music. But the music they were offering us <sighs> as... And as an alternative, I knew that the way was going to be very narrow and the path was extremely straight. <laughs> because I was like, I can't listen. Do you remember a group called Ambas? Oh, wow. So if you were really, really Christian group, you would wear brown safari suits, including you were a culprit. I heard you used to be in the choir. It was people like you. You know, including the women wear safari skirts. You know, in case I don't, there's really nothing called a safari skirt, but if there was, you know what I'm saying, skirts that reach here. And then it'll be brown or nude. Then someone will come and say, this is supposed to be my alternative to dynasty. Remember dynasty? You know dynasty. You don't know dynasty? Oh, I'm so old school. <laughs> well, they had this song called Baby, Here I Am. Ah, that song can remove anointing in your life. So anyway, I was supposed to leave that for this. And somebody will come and say, I've got an anointed song from the Lord today. Can you say, play it? Sing it. Uh, okay, this song will change your life. Okay, get, come on, you need to. I'm not singing this song if you don't. Say, sing. Oh, the Lord dropped it into my spirit in the, as I was sharing. And I know your life will never be the same again. Test it, test it. And then, person will go. There was just one chord I knew on the guitar. That, nwaka, nwaka, nwaka. I thought you were one of them now. Nwaka, 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 nwaka. You go for nwaka. The guy will shut up about you. Nwaka, nwaka. And they go, this is the song I'm going to sing it. Tell me to sing it. You want to encourage me? Hallelujah. This song is coming your way. Darling Jesus, darling Jesus. I thought, how am I going to survive this Christian walk? But you know, the youth of today are not having any of that because I stuck with it. But they are not having any of that. They want it excellent. Do you get what I'm saying? So they said to the owner of MTV, we hear that 13-year-olds like you. He said, they don't like me. I own them. He's talking about your children. So it's all very well for us, but what is happening to, happening to the next generation? They're not fooled. They want excellence. So we're having, going to have to do things excellently if the church is going to keep its own. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Oh, you should know that there are different mountains on the earth. Right now, there's a mountain of family, the mountain of media, the mountain of science, the mountain of science and technology, right? And you know, if you want to see the way the church is being portrayed, if somebody is saying something that the world does not want to hear, they make him look like so sweaty, idiotic, bigot. How many people listen to Ravi Zacharias? You should. I won't say more, but you really should. You really should. Because you need to have an answer to the questions that I asked you. A very intelligent one. Okay. I would like to say I'm rounding up. And really, I am, actually. Just a preacher's, you know, we round up a few times just that and we have various ways of doing it including is one yeah. just before I go is another one last time 
The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be exalted above all the mountains and above all the earth. Therefore, we're sent right into the midst of sinners. So if you're at work now and you see all well, everybody around is snorting cocaine into porn, into this, that is why you are there. That is why you are needed. But you know the beautiful thing about salt? It's always smaller than the stew. Always smaller than the chili when you're cooking the salt is a pinch the chili is a whole pot don't you get it therefore you will always be smaller than the environment that you are supposed to change interestingly when you go in you go in like salt salt makes no sound if you are cooking stew if your wife is cooking stew and you hear a whoosh when she puts in the salt don't eat it i'm just saying don't eat it it goes in quietly and works quietly but the work it does is irreversible no matter how big the pot of rice is, the salt is not intimidated by it. So no matter how small you are in that organization, the rest of them should not intimidate you. Because you carry a superior anointing. Do you understand? Hmm. So we go in as salt. We make sure that the church is not oversalted. We take the salt we're given on Sunday and go and use it out. Instead of crowding the church. Do you get what I'm trying to do? Good. We go into the institutions of the earth because God cares. All right. Rule down in the midst of thy enemies, don't we? Verse 3. Let's just move to verse 4. The people shall be willing. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Where I come from, what I want to do now is called breaking the table. Just say break it. Do you understand breaking the table? Yeah, shatter the paradigm. The Bible says that God has sworn and will not repent that Jesus Christ has been made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we want to understand because the Bible says as he is so are we in this world. Therefore, as Jesus is, that is the same way we are supposed to function. Let me give you Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11. Hebrews 7 11. I'm sure we're giving you that too. Hebrews 7 11. I want to wait for that. It's New Testament. Good. If therefore, because you know there's some people who go around saying anything you find in the Old Testament, you find the tithe in the Old Testament, oh, it's not in the new. Meanwhile, Jesus Christ himself said, this you should do, meaning tithe, and not leave the other things undone. So I need to give you a New Testament reference. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay, because this is Sunday morning and not Wednesday evening or digging deep. I'm going to have to unpack it. There are two kinds of priesthood we find. First, we find the Levitical priesthood, which is what Israel ran all the way till Christ came. And God said, I have sworn that you are rising after the order of a superior and more perfect priesthood, which is the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Which Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 decodes and causes us to understand. That is a priesthood of the kings and the priests. So the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and verse Revelation chapter 5 verse 10. Not only are we meant to be kings but priests. But the church has managed to undo the work of God. By telling the people of God that there's some men to be priests. Which are the fivefold, and then some men to be kings, and never the two shall meet. But that is not what God said. God said in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, You are meant to be kings and priests. This is why it is good to study the language you speak. Because and is a conjunction. If it meant that we should be either priests or kings, it would be priests or kings. Which means as you sit there, you're a king and a priest. So where are you supposed to function as a priest? You do know the work of a priest, isn't it? The work of a priest is to reconcile the earth unto God. The work of the priest is to make the earth like heaven. Do you get? The work of the priest is to mediate between man and God. Which means when my neighbor has an issue, the work of a priest is to bring the kingdom come and the will of God be done in the life of that neighbor. Do you understand? His son is on drugs. My work is to make sure that the boy is cleaned up. You know, my neighborhood has gone to seed. Mm. The work of a priest is to make sure that I get that neighborhood back to God. Let's get it right. God is interested in nations, countries. Do you understand what I'm saying? Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 makes it very clear. He says, when God created the nations, he separated the sons of Adam. He actually drew, 
drew the boundaries of the nation according to the number of angels in the heavenly court. That is what the Young's literal translation says, which means every country has an angel and a DNA and the way they're supposed to function, number one. Two, they have an agenda in the plan of God. Therefore, if you are sent to America, you need to ask yourself, what part of the agenda of America am I supposed to play? It's because you've forgotten all that and you're after mortgages, sausages, and milk. I don't know why people concern themselves. Some people are just concerned about eating. I'm so sorry, you will still love me. You know, just abundance of food because of that. They just buy the way they see it, watch it. But are you, do you get what I'm trying to say? You need to ask yourself, what is my own plan? This is what switches you from being an immigrant into an ambassador. Because when you take his agenda, he becomes interested in you. God is not interested in your vision. He's interested in his own vision. And he will make provision for his vision. Which means there shall be an, an abundant supply for what God asks you to do. But not for what you have decided that you must do. However, if you're an ambassador, don't forget the percusites are many. As I listed, my scripture still up. So we say we are priests and we are also kings. And we shall reign upon the earth. Therefore, God is interested in institutions. You see, the enemy is not really threatened by the church. You know why? We're largely irrelevant to his purposes once we do not touch the institutions of the earth. So he went after the institutions while the church was sleeping. The founding fathers of this nation wanted a theocracy, right? And they founded the institutions upon God. But a set of people came after later and systematically have been unpacking things while the church has been hollering on the Sunday morning. And the enemy says, go ahead and holler. When it's Monday, I will undo everything that you prayed on Sunday. Let us become interested in institutions. It's an institution, the systems and the processes that hold up society. Let us become interested in territory. God is a God of territory. You need to begin to see America as your territory. You need to begin to see your state as your territory. Your neighborhood as your territory. Your son's school as your territory. God can only use people of influence in this end time. And I'm going to end on this note. If you want me to give you an example, look at Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible says, I think in the book of John chapter 2757, just check all the gospels, 2757, anywhere you find, put it up. You find Joseph of Arimathea. And the Bible says he went in unto Pilate. When he talks about Joseph, he said, Joseph, he said, then came a rich man from Arimathea called Joseph. I need it in that here. Then came a rich man of Arimathea called Joseph. What they're saying is that, see, the Bible decodes it as, as, it, as it is important. Most important thing about him, he was rich. You can keep that for me. Two, he was from Arimathea. He had a location. He was known in society somewhere. Three, his name was Joseph. Because he was rich, because he served in the Sanhedrin, he was able to go to Pilate and ask for the body of Christ. Peter was very anointed. John was very beloved. Why didn't they go and ask for that body? Are you quiet? They were the closest to Jesus. But you know what Joseph did in the end? He preserved the body of Christ. You do understand what the body of Christ means in these last days. Someone came yesterday and was talking about the body of Christ going through persecution. If it is going to be preserved from persecution, we must have voices in the halls of power. Not necessarily being the president. But you know the president can be the head. But what turns the head? Is always something. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Hallelujah. So he took the body and preserved it. Who are the people God is going to trust in this end time to preserve his body? We are meant to be witnesses to the earth. That's what we're meant to be. In Acts chapter 5 verse 32, he's sending, what it is, is that God is sending secret agents Joseph of Arimathea was in the Sanhedrin, but the Bible says he believed in Christ, but secretly for fear of the Jews. 
So it doesn't mean you shouldn't be an open Christian, but it means that the first way that I know you're a Christian is not that you come with a big Bible to work and thump it down and say, I go to church. No. They should look at the way you talk in management meetings and ask, how come you always have the answer? Then you can say, do you really want to know? And then you tell them. Hmm. Acts 5.32, thank you so much, Technical. And we are his witnesses of these things. They had called the disciples and told them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And then the, God set them free from the, from, from, from the prison miraculously. Then they called them again and said, stop. And they said, we cannot stop because we're his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God had given to them that obey him. I love the scripture so much because it says two of us are in partnership, God and I. Do you get? I am a witness, but so also is the Holy Ghost. Which means, I am a witness means I am one that gives proof to the fact that is in the word of God. Or to the truth of the word of God. Are you getting it? If you doubt the word of God, look at me and see my life. Who can say that confidently? Now, not only I give witness to the fact that Christ is true. But the Holy Ghost in my life is affirming with everything he does that Christ is true. And how does he do it? He smuggles us into this institution, smuggles us into all these palaces of power and corridors of power, to Hollywood, into the media, into the mind control systems of the world. While you were watching soap operas have so, you know, seeped into your houses, telling your children what is right. Then you find your babies come and say, I'd like to be a good witch. Seriously, because the cartoons say. And you think it doesn't, you don't even know what they're watching. I'm not blaming you. I'm just telling you that watch out for these things. And God said, I to have my own way. Judges chapter 634. Now I'm totally close. Judges 634. I only promised once. This is the second time. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered unto him. Actually, another translation says, the real meaning of came upon is the spirit of the Lord put on Gideon. Which means you saw Gideon, but it was not Gideon. So you see Jumoke, it is not Jumoke, something who you cannot see. Someone is powering her. So you get up to make a presentation, you make, get up to make a sales pitch, and they think they can see Samson. It's not Samson. Somebody else is talking. So we need to get up now and decide that as I go in there, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is going with me. Which means the partnership, the discussion, the intercourse with the Holy Spirit, the koinonia. Do you understand the partnership which I get up and say, Holy Spirit, we have a presentation this morning. How shall we go? The Bible says that when Jesus Christ came before John the Baptist, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and rested. That word rested is so important because what it means is that he passed. And a dove is a very skittish bird. That means we, you, you have to be careful everywhere you go, knowing that you carry someone with you. You are not alone. Let us rise. We only have one prayer. And we're going to just pray. God anoint me. That's all. Anoint me to carry your power back as I go in on Monday. And now I know I'm not going alone. I'm carrying someone. Somebody has put me on. Honestly, he said, and the Holy Ghost which he has given to those who love him. So do you have the Holy Ghost? Do you want a fresh anointing? Now look at what the anointing is for. The Bible says concerning Samson. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times between Dan. You understand? And you know what? I, what I love is that I'm sure Samson was a skinny guy. Honestly. He couldn't have had muscles. If he was muscular, they would have expected him to put on those shows of strength. Delilah would not have messed with him. Delilah would not ask a muscular guy that looks like a bouncer, what is the secret of your strength? Duh, can't you see the secret of my strength? Do you get what I'm trying to say? The guy must have been really skinny. So she was like, what? Why do these things happen? But what I love about the spirit of God in Samson, he was normal until the lion roared and then something came upon him. So you see, you don't have to feel the fact that God is with you. Wait until the lion roars. Then you will know that somebody is with you. Do you get it? Anoint me. Let us pray. That's all. Father, anoint me. Let me carry the power of God back. Hallelujah.